Hello everyone, my name is José Vasco. I'm the director of the Office of Investor Protection and Assistance at the Securities Exchange Commission of Brazil. I'd like to welcome you all to the World Investor Week global webinar on investor resilience. Uh, World Investor Week is an IOSCO worldwide campaign to raise awareness of the importance of investor education and also to disseminate key messages on investor education and protection. The campaign in 2022 is covering topics such as investor resilience, sustainable finance, crypto assets, frauds and scams prevention. This webinar will discuss financial resilience of retail investors in the context of the current ever-changing global markets by gathering different perspectives from regulatory, international and financial industry. This webinar will be a forum for debating the challenges that lie ahead for consumers in times of rapid change with new and emerging risks, but also great opportunities to access finance and plan for the financial future. So we will cover those close linkages between financial resilience, financial literacy and financial inclusion and analyze the importance of robust financial consumer protection frameworks. Our invited speakers will debate some recent trends affecting Main Street investors, such as the growing interest in alternative investments, the gamification of retail investing, the use of social media and digital platforms to promote investor opportunities, and also the rise of retail traders amid increased market volatility. This event will also explore the importance of financial planning to navigate this changing financial landscape and how uh, investors can evaluate the emerging risks, socioeconomic, environmental, geopolitical, misconduct and financial fraud within the context of investors' long-term investment goals. Today, we will have presenters from three continents and I'd like to thank all colleagues that are taking the time to join us today and contribute to this important discussion for investors. So today we will have Miles Larbe, uh, who is the head of Financial Consumer Protection Unit at OECD. Our colleague Mary Head from the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy at the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Also uh, another colleague from C8, the Committee 8 of IOSCO, Maria João Teixeira, Director of the Market Conduct Supervision and Investor Department at CMVM Portugal, Andrea Middle, Board Member of FPSB and Partner at Durf Financial Planners, and uh, Dante Degori, uh, the Head of Stakeholder Engagement at FPSB, an important organization and supporter of World Investor Week that uh, every year organizes the World Financial Planning Day. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining us th this webinar and give the floor to my colleague, Miles. Miles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vasco, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody joining this webinar. It's my pleasure to be here to support this event and to support World Investor Week um, organized by IOSCO every year. It's a terrific initiative to bring attention to the importance of, of, of planning uh, investments and finances. Uh, my name is Miles Larby, as Vasco said, I'm responsible for financial consumer protection at the OECD. Um, if I could get my presentation. Voila, perfect. Um, and what I'm going to do today in my presentation is talk about some of our research and policy work in the area of financial resilience um, and how that informs our global standards on financial consumer protection and the role of financial consumer protection to support financial resilience of consumers and retail investors. So just to begin with, to sort of set the, the scene, so to speak, um, 
The OECD is an international organization of 38 member countries, but we work with many, many other countries around the world and international organizations, including, of course, IOSCO and, and F FPSB. Um, the OECD's uh, mission is to develop better policies for better lives across a number of policy domains. And in the area of consumer finance, which is uh, where I work, uh, that involves financial consumer protection, financial education or financial literacy, and financial inclusion. And this slide here really is designed to set out our, the way we approach this, the, this, this area, this policy area. We see that uh, financial consumer protection, financial inclusion, and financial literacy are really interrelated policy agendas that work together or complement each other in order to achieve or to support an objective of financial well-being of consumers, of families, of communities. And when I say financial well-being, I'm also encompassing in that uh, elements or, or the concept of financial resilience as well. So in terms of financial resilience, what does that mean? Uh, well, financial resilience, I should perhaps first of all say, is essential to financial well-being. We see it as a, a sort of a, uh, a part of and also an input to um, uh, financial well-being. Uh, this slide, which has been distilled from our research uh, and policy analysis, sets out, uh, I guess, a a definition or a sort of an approach or framework, if you like, for, for understanding financial resilience. You can see there on the slide that it's sort of briefly defined as the ability to resist, cope and recover from negative financial sh shocks. Uh, but the rest of the slide, the rest of the framework shows the different um, um, inputs or drivers, shall we say, of financial resilience. And I think what's important to point out here is that there are some of those drivers or factors where an individual can influence um, their sort of the, the, the situation that they find themselves in or perhaps their level of financial resilience. So, for example, um, um, you know, their, their, their level, their, their, their engagement in personal finances and their levels of financial literacy. But there are, of course, many other factors that are relevant to a person's financial resilience that are not in their influence or control, uh, that sit in the external environment and of course impact on a person and, and can affect their level of financial resilience. So that includes sort of environmental factors such as the, um, um, you know, the economic environment or importantly for this presentation, the system of financial consumer protection in which they're operating. So the conditions that they find themselves in when they're engaging with financial products and services, but also the incidence of what we call here negative financial shock. So things that may be unforeseen um, that happen to a person, and this takes us to the idea of the role of sort of financial planning, I suppose. But, you know, for example, loss of, of, of income through a job loss, um, um, a health issue, um, or some unexpected expenses, all of these things can affect a person's financial resilience and of course we saw that um, perhaps um, in a very sort of significant and systemic way through the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic which I'll touch on in, in just a moment. But just to provide a bit of data, um, the OECD we collect a lot of data and do a lot of research to provide evidence to, to countries to help them with their national approaches and also to guide international policy development so this slide draws on some research that we conducted in 2020 to look at the levels of uh, financial literacy and financial well-being and financial resilience amongst the adult population. The research was conducted across 26 different countries all around the world. And, and this slide um, shows some um, of the aggregated results. And what we can see here is that um, uh, levels of financial resilience before the pandemic happened um, were already sort of uh, were, were, were sort of fairly low in some cases. There were some um, areas where people had greater financial resilience. For example, about fifty percent, over fifty percent of people around the world said that they would be able to cover a major expense. Whereas, on the other hand, we saw um, um, indicators of lower financial resilience. For example, people, uh, how would people manage if they lost their main source of income, and would they be able to cover 
ongoing living expenses for at least one month. Um, and there you can see that, uh, you know, um, at least 10% of people said that they would not be able to manage in that situation. What we found through our research um, is that there is a positive correlation between financial literacy efforts, so efforts to, to encourage people um, to be more confident and informed in their financial dealings um, between financial greater financial literacy and greater financial resilience. And that holds true in respect of knowledge, behavior and attitudes. Um, I think that, um, you know, um, we all know that improving financial knowledge is, is important and useful, but it's really how that is and can be translated into behaviors. That's, that's probably the most important um, part of that equation. So it would be impossible to talk about financial resilience without talking about the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that that has had on consumers and societies and economies all around the world. So at the OECD, we did research, we, we surveyed um, 120 organizations from 80 countries to look at uh, the effect of the, the pandemic on financial consumers and the sort of responses or the sort of measures they were putting in place in terms of financial consumer protection to so to protect and support consumers who would otherwise be facing financial hardship or increased financial resilience so on this slide um, you can see the results some of the results of that research which um, show the risks to financial resilience that were particularly highlighted as a result of the of the pandemic and of course you know no one on this call, I'm sure needs reminding that, you know, the pandemic and, 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 and you know, in some cases, obviously the effects are still with us, um, uh, was characterized by shutdowns, uh, loss of income, loss of employment, um, furloughs, and so on. So it was, um, countries told us that the, uh, the risks to consumers included reduced financial resilience. This was the highest category risk for low and middle income countries and the second highest for high income countries, increased vulnerability to frauds and scams, which of course, um, falling victim to a financial scam um, effectively um, you know, shatters someone's level of financial resilience. Um, and also um, an increased concern about levels of financial inclusion, exclusion, sorry, due to a lack of access to financial products and services. As I said, we asked countries what sort of measures they were putting in place to support financial resilience during the pandemic. And some of these I'm sure will be familiar to people on the call. And the most, um, the most common measure that was put in place was um, arrangements to um, um, assist consumers who were experiencing financial difficulty or financial hardship as a result of the pandemic. And I think the most common form of this was in the in in the form of um, loan repayment holidays or credit moratoria they're called different things in different countries but measures that were put in place to allow consumers who were suffering from reduced income um, or reduced um, um, uh, revenue um, to to be able to pause their repayments particularly on home loans and mortgages um, as a temporary measure to basically address the, the financial hardship that was being experienced as a result of, of, of the pandemic. So while the pandemic, of course, um, you know, in, was a sort of a, you know, a temporary or, or a sort of a, a temporary phenomenon um, and one that, of course, we are still coming out of and, and um, we're all very much looking forward to that. Some of the lessons um, and, and, and issues that were highlighted in the experience of the pandemic are, of course, give us longer term um, uh, lessons, as I say, to be built into um, policy development going forward. And this is where um, I want to mention the G20 OECD principles on financial consumer protection, which are the international standard for consumer protection frameworks around the world. Um, there are currently 10 principles that set out the foundation stones of an effective um, financial consumer protection framework. And they've been endorsed by the G20, by the OECD and the FSB, but they're applicable to all countries and all sectors of the financial services industry. Um, and so these principles are designed to guide countries as they develop and implement their own financial consumer protection frameworks. 
The principles are 10 years old, and so we are actually um, in the middle of doing a review and update of the principles to basically to see how they've been implemented, but more importantly, to find out are there sort of developments or gaps in the principles that need to be addressed so that they are forward-looking and continue to reflect global, global best practices, um, including um, experiences, as I say, and lessons that we learned through the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. So on this slide, the, the update is, is happening. Um, it's, it's, it's been underway for the last um, 18 months or so, and we're nearing the final steps now. And on this slide, um, I can show you the updates to the, uh, the principles on financial consumer protection. So the, um, on the slide there, you can see uh, the new, the changes or rather the updates that we're making to these principles. Um, firstly, to add a new principle on access and inclusion and another new principle on quality financial products. There would also be three new cross-cutting themes uh, focused on digitalization, sustainable finance, and financial well-being, which is, of course, where we are talking about today, financial well-being and, and financial resilience. Um, and so these new principles, these updated principles, um, are um, in the final stages of, of endorsement by the G20 and by the OECD. Um, and will be ready to be um, distributed and implemented from probably the end of the year onwards. Um, and I think uh, on this slide, I can show you some examples from some, some more specific examples from the principles about how financial consumer protection uh, can support financial resilience of consumers. So I mentioned access and inclusion, that's an important principle. And this involves a number of things, but for example, addressing the barriers that may prevent consumers from accessing and using financial products, but also making sure, and this is very much, as I say, a lesson that was picked up from the, um, uh, the COVID-19 experience, um, financial inclusion and access also makes sure that consumers who are already in the financial system can remain included, for example, if they experience temporary financial hardship. Um, and as I said, most commonly, that could be, for example, if a consumer needs temporary assistance with, um, with meeting loan repayments or loan commitments. Another really important area where financial consumer protection uh, frameworks can support financial resilience is through the application of equitable and fair treatment of consumers. This is one of the principles uh, that I just mentioned. It's also a feature of many, if not most, countries' financial consumer protection laws and regulations, treating customers fairly. However, that's integrated into the, into the framework. And of course, that includes, and this is specifically highlighted in the updated principles, includes consumers who may be experiencing vulnerability. Um, and again, that was something that we saw in the experience of, of COVID-19. And I think one of the things to consider there uh, for financial consumer protection regulators and supervisors is um, this concept of what makes a consumer vulnerable is actually quite a nuanced um, and sophisticated area of, 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 of policy or thinking. Um, um, and I think we need to recognize that uh, vulnerability can arise for consumers at different stages and in different circumstances. It's not the case that you know, a particular group of consumers should be deemed vulnerable at all times. It's that people can experience as they travel through life, and particularly if they experience things that are outside of their control, that can make them vulnerable even for a short time um, where, where, where some of these issues may be, may be relevant for them. Um, and finally, quality financial products, which I, I already mentioned, um, the importance of um, the design uh, the distribution and the governance of financial products so that they are designed to meet the interests and objectives of target consumers and contribute to their financial well-being. This is a new element of the updated principles. And I think it's really important because it demonstrates that, you know, um, while disclosure and conduct requirements are incredibly important, there is also, um, it's also very important to ensure that the underlying products themselves are, are consumer centric and designed to meet um, um, to contribute, as I say, to the financial well-being of, of the consumers that they are marketed to. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview of, of certainly from the financial consumer protection angle 
how that's connected to and supports uh, financial resilience, um, as I say, of, of consumers, of families and communities. So thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Back to you, Vasco. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Myos. Uh, great points. Uh, I think that uh, I'd like to highlight the positive relationship uh, between financial literacy and financial resi resilience and the role of financial resilience may play on financial well-being. I think uh, you uh, presented very important insights uh, for policymakers and financial supervisors on those interrelated uh, policies uh, to support financial well-being and financial resilience. And I think this is a challenge for financial regulators. Uh, that, so we need to use different combination of policies and tools uh, to effectively educate, uh, protect, and, pro and provide access, financial inclusion, uh, to investors. I think this is a great transition. Uh, for our next speaker, uh, Mary Head from United States SEC. Uh, as you, we all know, the United States is the world's largest economy by gross domestic product and has by far uh, the largest share of the world stock markets, being home to over 6% of the total world equity market value. So what happens in the United States does not, does not stay in the United States. It's very important for us also. We are, I'd like to hear from you, Mary, your views on investor resilience. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Mary, uh, I think it, it, you need to unmute yourself. It seems that we cannot unmute you. Okay, I think that's better. Now we can hear you. Very you. good. Um, thank you, Vasco. And thank you, Miles, for the information. It was very informative. Um, before I begin, let me state that the views I expressed this morning are my own and not those of the commission or its staff. I work in the SEC's Office of Investor Education, and we connect with retail investors in three ways. One, we respond to investors' complaints and questions, thousands every year, and we have had a big uptake over the last year or so. Two, we have a team of lawyers, subject matter experts, who write the retail facing content that we post on investor.gov, our website for individual investors. Three, we conduct investor outreach with an emphasis on new investors, women, the military, and underserved communities. In keeping with the themes of this year's World Investor Week, we designed our messaging around investor resilience. Given current economic conditions, this topic could not be more timely. Investors are dealing with high levels of geopolitical uncertainty, inflation, and market volatility. So what does it mean for an investor to be resilient under these conditions? Most define resilience as the ability to withstand and recover from financial shocks. Investors need a plan for short, medium, or long-term decision-making, as the case may be, that has the flexibility to adapt and weather changes in an uncertain future. The pandemic was a wake-up call. A 2021 study by the Stanford Center on Longevity found that about a third of American families could not cope with a medium financial shock even before the pandemic. Then the pandemic came along. The pandemic changed the way we looked at the world and how the world worked. As a forthcoming IOSCO report states, the pandemic raised concerns about the vulnerability of investors across all age groups, particularly in the context of social isolation, commission-free trading, and an increasingly digitized world. There were high levels of market volatility, more investors trading for themselves, 
the gamification of investing, uh, an increased reliance on social media for advice, and an increase in fraud and scams. Some of these trends predated the pandemic, but most were accelerated during that time, and they will continue. So as we are appear to be emerging, emerging from the pandemic, although under continuing economic difficulties, this is the time to remind investors about the benefits of becoming more resilient. This slide shows you the changes in the retail landscape. Uh, retail trading has grown exponentially. Investors are online and half of U.S. retail investors last year were completely new to the market. They are younger, more racially and ethnically diverse. They have lower incomes and accounts. They trade frequently and they display lower financial investing knowledge than more traditional counterpoints. To mark World Investor Week, we issued a bulletin on investor resilience jointly with the CFTC, FINRA, and the New York National Futures Association and state securities administrators. The bulletin offers some very basic steps for investors to consider. Individually, none of the recommended practices is new. These are messages that we all continually emphasize and re-emphasize. I think they also make a lot of sense even in today's modern digital world. They still have relevance and taken together, though they are very common, common sense steps, they provide a framework that we hope will help investors achieve resilience. Uh, even World Investor Week's messaging about resilience will hopefully raise with investor awareness. So very briefly, let me run through the points we made in the bulletin. Next slide, please. Um, emergency fund. This is money set aside to cover unexpected expenses. Having an emergency fund for three to six months of living expenses is often the first thing on the to-do list for financial well-being. But for many people, especially those living paycheck to paycheck, this is easier said than done. Next slide. Diversification. Again, this is not a new message. Diversification reduces overall investment risk. You can diversify among asset categories and between asset cards. Investors may also think about investments that may perform differently under different market conditions. And of course, many investors achieve diversification through mutual funds and ETFs rather than individual stocks. Uh, next slide. Don't expose yourself to losing more money than you can afford to lose. All investments have risk, and in some cases, trading on margin with options or short selling, you can more, lose more money than you invest. Next slide. Do your research. Before investing, do a background check on your investment professional. Make sure they are licensed or registered. Approximately three quarters of our retail facing cases have involved an unlicensed investor protection, investor pro professional, or the promise of unrealistic returns. Second, verify that the investment professional is who they say they are. You may have to call the phone number they give or look at the website they promote. Given the growing number of impersonation cases we see, this additional step is important. Fraudsters have very sophisticated techniques to fool people into thinking they are legitimate. If people get a letter purportedly from the SEC, we encourage them to check with us first. And third in this category, review the investments disclosure documents and don't make the mistake of relying on testimonials or celebrity endorsements. Finally, watch out for investment fraud. We know that retail equity trading has grown exponentially since the pandemic. And where there are investors, fraudsters will follow. Investors are online, they are social, and many are relatively affluent. 
On the other hand, scans are cheap. They reach many potential victims and they have the potential for anonymity. A FINRA Investor Investigation Foundation study on financial fraud found that eight in 10 respondents have been solicited to participate in a potentially fraudulent offering with 11% losing a significant amount of money. Um, as I mentioned, we have seen an uptick in investment fraud and scams. Uh, in addition to more traditional forms of pump and dumps and Ponzi schemes, romance schemes, impersonation and crypto scams are contributing to investor losses, which total in the billions every year. We can estimate that, in, at least in the United States, uh, losses range from 20 to $50 billion annually. Um, the romance scams are so uh, prevalent that the FBI issued a public service announcement cautioning investors. Social uh, media is the platform for fraudsters to contact vulnerable people. And there's so much personal data online that it's not extremely difficult for fraudsters to approach vulnerable citizens. Um, the fraudsters appear to be genuine, caring. They pretend to make plans to meet the victim and even some have proposed marriage. They point the victim to a apparently lucrative uh, investment opportunity often in the crypto area and encourage the victim to invest. Initially, uh, they are allowed to um, show a profit and to make small withdrawals. But as the fraudster puts more pressure on them to continue to make investments, um, they begin to be puzzled. And when they finally stop or run out of money, um, the fraudster disappears. Uh, and in one in an instant, they have lost their earnings and their savings. Now, I thought you might be interested in seeing some of the come-ons uh, that my colleague Owen Donnelly has found uh, that run afoul of the red flags of fraud. So in this, in the first case, uh, you can see that he is talking about making $100,000 in interest a year. Uh, the next one. Here uh, we hear the, we see the guaranteed uh, excessive profits. And here this, this uh, purported fraudster is advertising a, a scheme that's 100% risk-free. Next, please. Here again, they are holding out the promise of huge gains, 500 a week, earning you almost $10,000, and, 10, and 1,000 a week, earning you $1,600 weekly. Next. And this one is my, my favorite one. They are advertising a, an investment opportunity, um, even in a bearish market. So those are just some of the examples. And, and now I want to show you a video that we publicized uh, just this week for uh, investor investment. And so if you'd play the and video, please. My program has changed people's lives. Let's check in with one of my newest members who's made over $100,000 in just a few short weeks. Hey, Rich, how's it going? Awesome. I've made $1,934 in the last 10 minutes. We'll be millionaires by the end of the year. My name isn't really Rich. It's Dylan. I'm not a real investor. In fact, the How We Trade program is completely fake. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's Office of Investor Education created these videos to show you what real scams look like. There are a lot of fraudulent promotions on the internet trying to get you to invest your money. I'll walk you through how to spot red flags of fraud so you don't end up becoming a victim of an investment scam. I'll also tell you about steps you can take to better protect yourself. Hey, Tom McWardle here. I'm an investment pro. Let's stop right here. 
Is he really an investment pro? Type his name into the search box on investor.gov to find out if he's licensed to sell investments. Most con artists are not. And I've made my clients millionaires. Do you want a new car, a new house, a life of luxury? Looks fantastic, right? This is how they try to lure you in. They show you a bunch of luxurious images and tell you this could be yours. The truth is, only the fraudsters will be enjoying a life of luxury after they steal your hard-earned money. Promises of great wealth are a red flag of fraud. You can earn an extra $500 per week, guaranteed. And more than 65% of our accounts earn $10,000 a week after 12 months in the program. $500 a week guaranteed? Likely $10,000 a week after 12 months? Don't trust anyone who promises you will make a lot of money with no risk. The only place you'll find high guaranteed returns is in an investment scam. Every investment has risk. Generally, the higher the returns, the higher the risk. You could even lose all of your money. Most fraudsters spend a lot of time trying to convince investors that extremely high returns are guaranteed or can't miss. Stay clear if you hear anything like that. Now there are a lot of scammers out there posing as experts. This is a common tactic fraudsters use. They try to make you think they are genuine by telling you to watch out for other people trying to take your money. After getting my MBA and working at top financial firms all around the world. If this guy has an MBA, then I have three PhDs, which I don't. Fraudsters tend to make up or exaggerate their credentials. They may try to build credibility by claiming to be with a reputable firm or have graduated from a prestigious school. Don't invest with someone just because the person claims to have an impressive background or track record. I'm only giving access to the first 100 subscribers. Many fraudsters try to pressure you to invest right now, claiming that only a certain number of investors can get in on it. Or they may tell you that the offer will disappear in a matter of hours. Don't let fraudsters play on your fears of missing out. Do your research and take your time to make a decision on all investment opportunities. I've made $1,934 in the last 10 minutes. Fraudsters love to create a buzz and use fake testimonials to convince you that others have invested. Don't be fooled by actors, like me, pretending to be real investors. And even if a movie star, professional athlete, or celebrity claims to have made money, it still isn't a good idea to make an investment decision just based on that. The next time you see an over-the-top sensational video trying to get you to invest, remember these three things. One, look for the warning signs of fraud, especially promises of great wealth, high guaranteed returns, and pressure to invest right now. Two, check the seller's background on investor.gov. Three, take your time researching any investment opportunity. Before you invest, investor.gov. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, the point here is that none of the steps that we emphasized in the bulletin and the points that are made in the video are basic. Uh, they have relevance for investors, I think, no matter the conditions of the world or whether you're a digital investor or not. They all go together to make sense. Um, I just want to wrap up by acknowledging the close relationship between financial resources and financial literacy and financial resilience. Investor education is a key part of efforts to raise investor awareness of resilience. And the challenge is always to make investor education engaging and effective. Coming up with creative and innovative investor initiatives 
thinking about the best way to reach investors and identifying the most effective channels of communication to reach targeted groups are all part of the work of investor education. Evaluating the effectiveness of our programs is another important part of the job. Overall, our mission is to help investors make better, more informed decisions and to avoid fraud. And this will also help to make investors more resilient. Thank you. Uh, this is great, Mary. And thank you so much for presenting uh, the recent changes in retail uh, investors uh, landscape in the United States and share information on some cases and examples of red flags. Uh, I think it's impressive that in such a developed financial market, there is still room for such an impressive growth of retail traders' numbers. Uh, in just one month, more Americans download an investing app than the total number of retail investors in equity markets in Brazil. So this is huge. Uh, so, and I want to let you know that your website, the whole way website, inspired us to launch a similar uh, website in Brazil. And the and we got a 20% uh, conversion rate. So 20% of the internet users that landed in that page, in our page, try to invest or to get more information about investing. And they were using all the, the same tactics uh, that uh, you share with us. So this is a global phenomenon. And, and thank you so much for sharing your, also your insights. Uh, so uh, with that, I think uh, I'd like to move to another market now in Europe. And I, I'm pleased to have you, Maria João, uh, from CNVM Portugal here. Uh, please let us know what's happening in Portugal, in Europe, to promote investor resilience. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to be here in the and for CMVM to also present what we're doing in, in Portugal. In fact, this is a global market. You will see some similarities uh, from what we have just heard from, from other markets. And, um, and in fact, that's why in the C8 uh, from Yosco, we share this kind of experiences. As Vasco was just saying that uh, we can learn from each other also in the way that we do financial education. Yes, um, thank you. And also, um, so I am heading the department for market conduct supervision and investor. We have uh, this area in CMVM. So we are the capital markets regulator and supervisor in Portugal. So I'll try to do some, um, uh, give you some information about uh, what we're doing throughout my presentation, where I will cover two different uh, main areas. One, uh, I'd like to to highlight uh, some aspects of the new investment reality uh, coming from digitalization, and also the more recent global trends that we are seeing in the global context. context. So I have a presentation, I will try to share it with you. I hope you can see it now. Okay. Yes. It, it is. Okay. Um, so again, uh, we are in the World Investor Week. Uh, CMVM has been in the coordinating that uh, week for um, Portugal uh, since the very beginning in 2017, being a member of the C8 again. And it's been quite successful too. So, um, and a good opportunity for us to give some uh, messages for investors to cover the main topics uh, uh, for investor protection. And it's a very intensive uh, week where we we try to do that work. And it's been uh, growing in impact in the number of investors and number of initiatives. Of course, we have eleven uh, partners, uh, different associations. Uh, the central bank uh, and uh, other authorities that help us to to spread the message to many uh, segments and many publics. So it's it's been very interesting. So it's good also to be here with all of you I mean, in a more global uh, space. So um, excuse me. Okay, so uh, starting with the new investment reality, I thought uh, under the financial resilience, the resilience topic that we are 
um, covering here for the investor. Um, I think it is worthwhile to, to talk about what we are seeing now as uh, the way investors, uh, namely retail investors, how do they trade and how do um, come to the market nowadays. And this has to do really uh, with two main aspects that I'd like to highlight. One is the digitalization and new business model that uh, arise with these um, uh, e-channels, the possibility of using digital platforms with very easy uh, access, low cost in some cases, you, you all even uh, have zero cost, uh, zero cost um, offers from uh, some platforms. We also know there's other other um, situations can arise with that as the FOF, uh, payment for order flow that we have heard in the last uh, uh, year or so. And, um, and also we see the rise of social media and the influence uh, of the social media um, in the investment space. We, we have investors relying on the information provided uh, from influences in the social media. media. We have um, the sense of community that uh, we have in the social media who is also important and influenced the way uh, uh, investments are chosen and the way investors act and trade. Of course, gamification was also mentioned by by Mary and um, and and Miles before. Um, it's something that uh, is attracting more investors to the market, make trading fun and easy, and uh, through apps and mobiles, very easy to to uh, start trading uh, with gamification. And um, we also see the access to alternative investments, as some of you have mentioned before also. We have um, uh, lots of new joiners in the market um, interested in investing in crypto assets, which are, of course, in, in many markets, as, as in Europe for the moment, unregulated space. Um, so we'll have the markets uh, in crypto assets regulation coming uh, next year in a phased way, um, starting with the uh, asset reference uh, tokens and e-money tokens to be regulated, but it will it will be a, a progressive um, introduction of regulation in, in Europe uh, regarding that. But for the moment, we see lots of new uh, investors being attracted to invest in crypto assets. And uh, of course, it's out of the competence of CMVM and other European regulators. So you need, you, we need to highlight that to investors. Another enable, enabler of this uh, uh, new investment reality, in fact, is um, was uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19, the lockdown that it uh, uh, enforced people to do. And, uh, and also we still have remote uh, work and I believe forever that will be uh, continuing to have that. And with that, it comes, um, uh, namely with the, from the lockdown, more savings. Uh, we have seen in Europe an increase in, in savings from uh, um, families. Uh, so more money because no traveling, no uh, restaurants. To, so some more money to invest and more time to do that. So that's a tendency that uh, we have seen and it helped uh, this, new, this new reality of investments. So um, we see some opportunities in the, this new uh, context. We see uh, coming from this new way of um, trading. We see new investors in the market. We have seen retail orders uh, volumes increasing a lot from 2019 until this year. Um, and we have seen that retail proportion of investment is increasing. Uh, it increased uh, just in one year from uh, 2019 to 2020, uh, 10%. And the average volume that uh, of the retail investor also increased 10% uh, in that year. Um, and we also see that uh, the big percentage of investment is really on shares. It's, it's in the equity market that really interests these, uh, these investors. We have seen an increase of investment in shares of 80% uh, from 2019 to 2020 in Portugal market. So, um, and uh, um, this has been done th uh, mainly through e-channels. We have seen an increase uh, of the e-channel proportion from 
55% of the orders to 70% of the orders. So we see traders more and more um, trading uh, through e-channels and not so much in, in the traditional way to send orders to their financial intermediaries. So we have young investors in, um, new in the market and they look for internet information. They uh, look for information in the internet, in social media sometimes, um, many of them, the young, the young ones mostly. And so this has been good for the market in the way that we have been uh, uh, we have been able to capture more investment in the capital markets to finance the economy. So it's important. Um, and on the other side, I also see an opportunity uh, for these new um, e-channels uh, to also help us to um, the financial intermediaries and also the regulators to provide to and to ensure that the product information comes adequately um, to the investor. Uh, so you can have the disclosures in the in internet uh, sites, you can have on home banking of the banks, you can test the profile of the investors. In a simple way, you can ensure that uh, the in a simple way, the information of products will um, be accessible and easy to understand to the investor. So it's uh, an opportunity also that comes from this digitalization so it helps us also to communicate with impact with investors to uh, to reach more investors and uh, to send uh, financial education messages also to to the investors which is a difficulty um for us to reach um as many investors as possible of course with these opportunities also some risks come uh, and we have um, the influence um, that the social media makes and the, the, some of these investors are not very experienced too and they tend to, to follow influencers, uh, to follow the, the social media community sometimes and not checking the information that is being received from there. And, um, and they tend to invest also some of them in the short term um, and not to diversify very much the investments they do. Um, also, they can be influenced by um, behavioral biases and um, with, uh, with influence uh, excess of confidence or also the fear of missing out the FOMO um, behavioral bias that sometimes happen to be following, uh, wanting to follow the the community and the, what they see in the social media being done and not to have a rational and um, and a thoughtful way of considering the information and also it was mentioned before that fraud and scams also uh, come globally to all the markets so the di digital um, channels also uh, allow for it to come easily and to be assess assessed easily by um, all the globe and we have seen uh, that the more than 40% of the claims we receive in CMVM are um, of business uh, that has been uh, proposed, proposed by non-authorized entities and more of 20% um, may be fraudulent um, uh, situations. Uh, so it's something that a uh, risk that arises also with this new reality. So in terms of the, um, another risk that I'd like to highlight here is that um, if the investor has a bad experience in acting and trading um, in, in this market, in the, he may lose the confidence uh, on the market and uh, avoid him to be an investor for the future. We have seen uh, many cases of, of people that have bad experience in, in, uh, in trading and then will not come back to the market, which is something that uh, should be avoided. Also. The digitalization uh, may have the risk of uh, digital exclusion, exclusion for people uh, that are not so much acquainted with um, the digital channels. So um, this is something that we would need to, to work on. So what is the regulator's role in this area? So in, in CMVM, um, of course, uh, we have, and namely in the department that I'm uh, uh, working on, we give some investor support, so we receive claims, requests of information for from uh, investors, and this is very a powerful uh, tool for us because we try to be as close and um, as open to receive 
uh, communications from investors because it helps us uh, to analyze and to identify risks they are um, that they have uh, when they trade and also vulnerabilities they they have uh, in in what they do so this will help us also to plan our supervision to on the conduct of business of our uh, the entities that we supervise financial intermediaries ma mainly and also um we help them also to solve their claims with the service providers um uh, when when um, they have a, a good claim on, on what they are um, arguing. So, and the, the other layer is, of course, the provision that we try to do in a preventive way and to be also uh, proactive in supervision that we do. And also, of course, to in the corrective, the corrective way. So, um, financial intermediaries will treat customers fairly in what they do and we try to avoid situations of mis-selling um, with the supervision actions that we we do and the, the third layer is important is uh, also is of course financial literacy and financial inclusion which is very important for the financial resilience of the investors which is the topic of of this webinar and for that we need to communicate with impact we use uh, different channels we use different formats we have our site um we uh, um, tend to be quite proactive and uh, with messages to to the investors we produce videos animations and so we try to find uh ways that will capture more the, the attention of the investors and make our message more um attractive and to really to be heard and followed by by the investors we have different um areas that we've been uh, covering uh, in our financial education uh, tools um, the fraud area of course we also issued some tips to young investors we also posted some uh, recommendations uh, regarding market volatility and the way that uh, investors react to that on the sustainability area also because there's new regulation in europe regarding the esg factors um communications uh, to to investors and in fact since august uh, this year um financial intermediaries are obliged to ask investors for their esg preferences uh, before they do a recommendation this will be for investment advice and for, for portfolio management that is done for investors they need to uh, financial intermediaries need to ask uh, the investors for their preferences so this is something that we also are worked on in terms of communication for the investors because it's quite new in the market and we need to be sure they understand um, what they will be asked for. So this is uh, uh, some examples. I'm afraid I cannot show videos or information. They are in Portuguese, so I, I don't think that apart from my friend Brazilian, uh, you would not be able to follow that. So uh, coming quickly to the re recent change in the global context, uh, the, the other topic that I mentioned I would cover. Of course, we are seeing some economic and geopolitical changes recently um, since the beginning of this year. Um, the monetary policy has changed, so no further uh, liquidity inject injection by uh, central banks. This had uh, an impact in the in, in the market also the some disruption in the distribution channel, channels of goods that we have been seeing and the, the increase in energy prices all of these uh, brought inflation which is quite new for the younger investors they are not used to see inflation and and to work and to invest with inflation and um and they don't have uh, sometimes as i mentioned the long-term perspective that will also protect them from the inflation impact. Um, so, and the, of course, we also have another topic that is important in the global context presently. It's the um, uh, sustainability that I just mentioned uh, before. So, in fact, um, what 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 is the impact of this new context that we are facing this year, where we are seeing that markets. Uh, are going down after the maximums upon maximums in the in the stock exchanges that we have seen until last year in the 
Um, now we are facing uh, some uh, decrease in the market. So if we are facing market volatility, we have been seeing lots of investors make making sudden decisions of selling. And with that, we have received many claims in CMVM regarding um, from investors that uh, were claiming that they did not knew that the investment fund, for instance, for instance, they were invested in at risk. So we also see and understand that. And so we did produce information about the importance of them reading the documentation of the products. And this is some work that we're doing also in, in financial literacy, because uh, an inquiry that we did recently identified that only one in four investors read the documents of the product before they invest, because most of them say they rely with the um, they rely with the um, with the, the recommendation that is being done by the account manager or the financial advisor. So, and they also, of course, suffer from uh, behavioral biases. All of these, uh, of course, and protects the the investor and the, the financial re resilience they they have. And the inflation also have as an impact in the um, in the capacity of the investor. Um, to 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 be able to to face his expenses and to do uh, some his investments. So what we've been doing regarding these challenges, coming more recent challenges, is to recommend make some recommendations again uh, regarding the importance of knowing the risk profile and the financial situation before making investment decisions. Try to find a good investment advisors. Uh, to check the information sources, to read the product documentation, try to, to understand what they are investing in and not to invest in, in if they don't understand, and to prefer to make long-term investments, um, to diversify, that was said, was said before, and consider the inflation impact in the expected return of the investments, which is also an important topic. Um, so we try, and, and just to conclude, um, we try to have an open channel to investors and to communicate with impact, uh, to be close and to provide some financial education that will help investors with uh, their investor resilience to the, the financial situation that, and economic situation that we are facing. And with that, I would end. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria João. Great to have an overview of the recent trends uh, in the investment landscape in Portugal and Europe. Uh, and also for covering some recent changes in the global context that are true, so also true for the region. I think we can see developments that are similar to what's happening in other regions and with retail orders, volumes increasing and also more access through digital channels and a growing number of investors that are new in the market with new risks to be addressed by regulators. I think uh, Mary's slides and, and your presentation speak volumes about the similarities among different markets and also speak for the importance of collaboration such as this campaign and also all the work of OECG and IOSCO. So thank you so much. And coming back to our agenda, we will continue with the perspectives of, of the market professionals, uh, and particularly with the financial professionals who have direct contact with retail investors. Uh, for this, I want to welcome Andrea Middel, who is ba also based in Europe, but also connect with a global perspective as a member of the board of FPSB. Uh, so, we are, uh, Andrea, we are a really international group, so please excuse me if I mispronounced your name and please correct me if I did that. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. You're very good. Thank you, uh, Vasco. And thank you to IOSCO and in particular to the Securities and Exchange Commission of Brazil for organizing this webinar during World and West Investor Week to address the important issue of investor resilience. And thank you also for inviting me as a speaker and panelist today to share my thoughts and more practical thoughts, I think, about this topic and the key role financial planning has in people's lives. 
Uh, my name is Andrea Middel, well pronounced, Vasco. Uh, I serve as a board member of FPSB, the Financial Planning Standards Board, and I'm the chairperson of the Professional Standards Committee. I'm a certified financial planner myself, and I'm a partner of Dove Financial Planners, uh, and it's an independent financial planning company in the Netherlands. When we talk about investor resilience, I see this as a shared responsibility amongst regulators, the financial industry, and consumers, investors themselves. Regulators focus on consumer protection and market regulation, and in an ideal world, the financial industry delivers transparent products and solutions recommended by reliable and competent advisors. And in that same ideal world, consumers understand their financial situation and know which financial decisions suits them best. And the more vulnerable consumers are, the greater the responsibility we see for the financial industry and the regulators. In that shared responsibility of regulators, financial industry and consumers, financial planners play an important role. Globally, more than 200,000 financial planners in 27 countries and territories are certified by the FPSB and can be recognized by the CFP designation. FPSB is a non-profit organization that establishes financial planning as a standardized profession in the interest of the public. FPSB has developed a framework of, for CFP certification that integrates competency, ethics, and professional sta practice standards for financial planning, along with requirements in the areas of education, assessment, and ongoing competency. And at this moment in my presentation, I first wanted to share with you more details about FPSB's standards to make clear to the audience, to you, uh, how competent, skillful, client-centered, and integer certified financial planners worldwide are. But I thought, well, maybe it's, it's a little bit boring for you and, uh, and for those who are not so enthusiastic about financial planning as I am. And it's going to take a lot of time to walk you through all the detailed documents about the standards. So I thought maybe it's better to tell you a more practical story, a real life client story that could have happened anywhere in the world. Um, but first, I want to eliminate a misunderstanding about financial planning and maybe also about investing. Um, many people think that financial planning is something for rich people. Uh, and I'm convinced, and I see it in my own practice, that financial planning can help everyone. In our day-to-day -day business, we see people who are wealthy as well as people who are just getting by. And in both cases, it's our goal to help them to make solid financial decisions that suit them. Well, back to the story. And let me introduce you to, to Mel and Jan. Uh, both 45 years old, and uh, they came earlier to me this year, and they are a, quite a happy, happy couple, never had serious financial questions, they both enjoy their jobs, and they have two teenage, teenage children, well, a middle-of-the-road family we have all over the world, I guess, uh, and they sometimes manage to save some money, but often spend it, especially when traveling the world. And Mel's parents passed away last year, and she inherited about 200,000 euros. And they have had never so much money on their in their bank, bank account, and it brings stress and discussions in their relation. Mel wanted to pay back the mortgage. Jan heard about some interesting and attractive investments, and maybe the red flag investments of merit. I don't know. But <laughs> he wanted to invest, uh, and Mel wanted to pay back the mortgage. Uh, together with them, I pr we prior prioritized their goals, and after an intense meeting, we found out that the first priority was to save for college funds for the children, 20,000 euro each. Next, after a few years of uh, COVID lockdowns, they wanted to enjoy a big family holiday worth also about 20,000 euros. And the rest of the money, about 140,000 euros, was intended to enjoy a comfortable retirement and, if possible, an early retirement. And after determining their goals, I reviewed their financial situation. How much do they earn now? How much pension is accrued? Which assets and loans do they have? How much can and will they spend and save? What's the risk tolerance, etc. 
And in the next meeting I had with them, I presented the results of the analysis and showed them the feasibility of their life goals in different scenarios. Saving, investing, paying back the mortgage, retire at 68, which is the designated retirement age in the Netherlands, or maybe earlier at 65, uh, and maybe saving inv or investing additional funds to make an early retirement possible. Uh, let me try to share my screen with you to demonstrate how we can show different scenarios to clients. Uh, and I may try to make a quite simplified scenario, but it's just making clear how financial planners work uh, uh, in advising about investments. And don't be afraid, when I share my screen, you don't see a real client. I made a mock account for Jan and uh, Mel. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, sure. And here you see um, in this, the screen the analyzer made with them. And this is the, the, the current situation. Uh, I, in, I analyzed their incomes. You see it here, their pension, the, the pensions they grew, the income, their house, their savings, and their mortgage. And uh, when we look at it here, we see the budget, which, which is the budget now and after they retire. And we see uh, here a, a red after retirement. So the income uh, is going down when they retire. Well, they inherited some money, so maybe they can use that for uh, their retirement. So I made a few analyzes. Analyze one was saving the heritage, the 140,000 they had, and saw that when you put the money on the saving account, um, you have the first about one, two, three, four, five years of your retirement. It's able to withdraw from the saving account because there is no interest on the saving account. So that's maybe not enough. Then I showed them a scenario when I said, well, if you pay back the mortgage, that was the one that Mel wanted, pay back to your mortgage. Uh, it means that you can save or invest more because the, there are less expenses, expenses, uh, less interest to pay, so you can save more. But still, it's only just in one, two, three, four years after retirement uh, that there is enough uh, money for them to withdraw from. I looked at investing the heritage, um, and I made a, uh, an, an assumption of a, a growth rate of 3%. Three, three and we saw that it's much longer they can uh, withdraw from the investments. And at last, I made an analyze for early retirement. Imagine they stop working at 65. We see the, they have to withdraw earlier, uh, but they have to spend now uh, to, to save or invest much more. So they uh, can spend less. So this kind of scenarios uh, we have um, when we talk with clients. Um, and the, in, in the analysis and meetings with Mel and Jan, I'm, I made clear that they need to make uh, a return on their, uh, I think the sh sharing my screen has stopped this, that's okay. Um, the analysis meeting with, with Mel and Jan made clear that they need to make a robust return on their investments to achieve their life goals. And if they were to pay back their mortgage, it would reduce their monthly expenses, but the money would be locked up in their house and not available for, re for a retirement income. They found out that talking too much about money and investments brought a lot of stress in their relationship. So I spoke with them about investing in a passive way. That way they could let their investments grow without having to monitor it constantly. And also they both want to make wise decisions uh, with the money since the money came from an inheritance. I spoke with them uh, about the basic principles of investing, the connection between risk and return, the connection between investment choices and their investment horizon, uh, the difference between a defensive portfolio with bonds and a more offensive portfolio of stocks, etc. And we ended up with the following advice. Keep, uh, they inherited 200,000 euros and keep 60,000 60, euros in a savings account for the big family holiday trip and the college fund for the children. The investment horizon is too short to invest that amount of money. And the rest of the money, 140,000, has a long horizon of about 20 years until retirement. 
and can be invested in a well diversified portfolio of stocks. When they get older, we can reduce the investment risk uh, gradually. And with this advice, it seems feasible for them to have a comfortable retirement from the age of 68. If they want to retire earlier, they have, they have to spend less now and invest a monthly surplus. In the end, they decided not to save extra now since they are now in an expensive phase of their lives. Well, this story maybe shows how financial planning uh, works. Before making investment decisions, think about life goals and priorities. Make a financial plan and stick to that plan as long as the goals and the personal situation remain the same. And we monitor, along with our clients, their financial plan in order to keep their life goals achievable. And so it transfers from a financial plan to financial planning. Um, and just a simple story. Uh, and I thought maybe it's, it's more illustrative to tell a story uh, than walk you all through the standards uh, to show you the, the process of financial planning and how financial planning can play a key role uh, in protecting uh, consumers from uh, taking too much risk uh, or not affordable risk. Thanks for your attention and for the invitation again. And um, back to you, uh, Fasco. Uh, was great, Andrea, for sharing, I think, for giving such a vivid description of uh, a real life story of an investor. I think we uh, regulators uh, inter interact with investors in different <laughs> moments, uh, sometimes with investor education before they make a decision. Uh, and uh, after a problem happens or so in this case when we are handling with complaints I and I've been working on this department of investor assistance for 15 years I have the feeling that I since that I'm similar to a medical doctor working in a hospital's emergency room so the role of financial planners in between the you know, investor education from regulators and the problem. So uh, supporting investors with advice is really key and crucial. So thank you so much for uh, sharing our views on this talk. And I think this is the perfect moment to invite Dante Degori from FPSB to uh, give uh, the perspectives of the profession. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Dante, for joining us today. I know it's uh, it's difficult for you for being today due to other circumstances. And thank you so much for joining us from Australia. I think it's almost a Saturday there, and it's a lot of efforts to, to be here. Thank you. And th thank you, Vasco. And, and again, I echo Andrea's comments uh, in, in welcoming uh, and having us here on the, on the panel. <clears throat> um, I, I'm with Financial Planning Standards Board, and um, uh, and, and it is Saturday morning here in, in Australia, uh, and I'd like to share a little bit about uh, briefly just in terms of the role of professions, I think, in terms of supporting investor resilience and investor protection. And I think uh, all, uh, all the comments that I've heard today uh, um, have, have echoed the fact that what we're trying to do here is support consumer investors to make decisions, providing them um, the opportunity to uh, navigate through all the noise that's been that is that is there, which I call the internet, the noise that is around uh, them to be able to make informed decisions that are appropriate for them, and that's very difficult. And as much as I think um, there's an opportunity and a goal um, to uh, exp or, or to try and prepare consumers and investors to be able to make those decisions on their own. The, the reality is, of course, there is a big role for not only regulation, but also the role of professions and professionals to support uh, consumers in that decision making. And, one, and, and the mission for FPSB as a, as a global standard setting body for financial planning is we, you know, our mission is to benefit the public by establishing and upholding and promoting worldwide professional standards in financial planning. And Andrea is a classic example uh, of that in terms of uh, being in practice and is certified. So there are many, I've, I've heard uh, the other uh, uh, talkers, speakers today talk about uh, investment advisors or distributors um, or intermediaries um, as part of the financial services landscape. Um, not all intermediaries or, dis or distributors of products uh, or sellers of products are in fact professionals um, or, or, or abide by a profession. 
And I think that's what's really important here is for consumer and for investor resilience is that they know where to turn or who to turn to to trust, whether that is uh, the regulator uh, websites uh, to be able to identify someone who is licensed uh, and and registered to actually uh, sell financial products, but also uh, to be able to um, check in with uh, a, a professional body um, that actually upholds uh, or, or certifies an individual to ensure that person is also subject to the norms of that profession. Um, and so as an example, um, I think, you know, uh, through FPSB Limited, we're across 26 territories around the world. Each of uh, FPSB affiliates are professional bodies in those respective countries, uh, and those uh, professional bodies uh, certify individuals. Um, so again, as I point out, not every uh, not every investment advisor or, or uh, financial product seller is a certified financial planner, but indeed all certified financial planners are licensed and regulated in their respective territories. Um, I also thought I'd, I'd share a little bit in terms of um, what CFP professionals have been hearing on the ground from, uh, from investors and from their clients. And, and again, this echoes many of the comments uh, that have been raised tonight as well. But um, we did a survey of CFP professionals um, early this year in response to IOSCO's paper regarding um, uh, investment uh, investment trends, looking at crypto assets, social media, etc. And what was quite interesting is that the demand. So I think everybody uh, in all in all markets have seen an explosion in demand since COVID. Um, in terms of uh, people being at home, accessing digital uh, digital platforms, accessing uh, or, or wanting to uh, to um, be part of uh, the latest uh, digital innovation of products such as crypto assets, as an example, um, and CFP professionals have been overwhelmed. Over 55 percent of respondents said that um, they had received demand from their clients about investing in crypto assets. Um, but interestingly, only 9% of those who responded, CFP professionals, said they were able to or did provide advice on crypto assets. So as you can see there, there's already a mismatch between the demand from investors about wanting to access uh, products such as crypto assets um, and the ability for professionals to respond. And so why didn't they respond? Why are CFP professionals uh, not responding? The number one reason was that uh, that they were not licensed to do so. So their firms or their employers, uh, all the licensing arrangements in their territories didn't permit them uh, to provide advice on crypto assets because why crypto assets in most territories, if not all, are not regulated financial products. Um, and so therefore there were big risks in respect to professionals uh, being able to provide advice directly on those. So again, there is this mismatch in respect to demand um, and supply of, uh, of trained professionals. So where have they turned to? They've turned to, uh, uh, which again, I think was echoed in some of the other comments, uh, to others, um, people who are filling a void in the market. We saw that video, that great video from Mary from the SEC in terms of how people are utilizing social media to attract investors, social media influencers. If I'm not wrong, I believe in recent days, the CEC has also um, uh, penalized Kim Kardashian uh, in terms of some crypto asset publicity on her social media. Um, so, you know, we can see the the, the height and demand uh, from, um, from the public for interest in these products and the use of celebrities and social media influencers to sell them. And indeed, again, going back to that survey, 70% of CFP professionals said that their clients went ahead and purchased crypto assets, even though they couldn't provide advice on them. They went and sourced that information themselves. They went and, uh, and, and either were influenced by some other party um, and invested in their own accord. Um, and again, the results told us that 62% uh, of those that invested on their own lost money, have lost or suffered a financial loss. Um, so again, I think it's very clear to see that there is, uh, you know, the, the, this, this void in respect to providing advice and services on these products 
is leading to uh, investors making decisions on their own uh, and, and suffering a financial loss as a result of that. Um, and again, this is something that we, we need to really consider, I think, collectively about how do we bridge that gap um, in combination of regulation, but of course, uh, with, with professional service providers like um, CFP professionals. Um, and I think um, in, in terms of, um, uh, if I could turn now just, just very quickly, there's been a lot of talk about investors um, and some of the, the data and trends about what they're doing. Um, we, knew, we knew before, and, and the impacts of COVID, we knew before COVID that many uh, consumers uh, were struggling to be able to um, meet their financial needs. We, we knew from research, or we know from research, even this is even before COVID, uh, that most consumers didn't have a financial plan. And so what I'll end on um, uh, at this point is saying that I think one of the, the, a very simple objective I think we have collectively, and this is echoed through World Investor Week and World Financial Planning Day campaigns, is that um, maybe not everybody um, can access a financial planner, even though I think they will benefit, as Andrea said. Um, what's really important is that everybody does have a plan, a financial plan, um, because the one thing that we know for sure is that if you, uh, if you fail to have a plan, you're effectively going to plan to fail. And I think that's a, a real key message for all of us here that uh, irrespective of your situation, circumstances or geography, um, I think it's imperative that collectively we encourage and, uh, and, and aim that all investors have a plan uh, before they invest. So I'll pause there, Vasco. Thank you very much again for having me on the panel. Excellent, Dan. Thank you so much for your perspective, FFPSB. Uh, I think it's really, we could, uh, your presentation and with Andrea complement the, the previous one from Myos and the regulators. I think we are all working on the same direction with the same mission, but with different roles. And World Investor Week actually is like an example of collaboration, not only among regulators, but also with professionals and the, the, the market participants. So we are really short of time, but I will try to have one or two questions. And I would uh, ask my colleague, uh, Miles from OECD, if perhaps he can uh, briefly speak about the role of financial consumer protection to support financial resilience. Uh, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Vasco. Thanks for the question and um, compliments to all of the other presenters. I think that there's some really interesting presentations and fantastic examples. Um, so I think when we talk about financial resilience, um, as I said in my presentation, I think there are elements of financial resilience that an individual can control or influence. But we need to be mindful that there are elements that are outside of their control that they have no influence over at all and i think that you know we've heard some terrific examples of campaigns of investor education which are very very important in building up confidence and, and, and knowledge and awareness and of course the important role of financial planning and people um, seeking out the, the advice of professionals to help them to plan but as I say, I think alongside that, we need to remember that we need a strong and effective financial consumer protection or investor protection uh, framework. Um, so that involves having oversight bodies um, such as the SEC, of course, that are able to oversee the market and take enforcement action where there is misconduct. Um, it involves having complaints handling arrangements that consumers and investors can access. It involves, you know, frankly, sort of, you know, treating customers fairly um, and responsibly in terms of um, how financial services providers deal with them. And then so all of that is needed to build and to support financial resilience. And then as I, as I was sort of highlighting in my presentation, even more specifically, or sort of thinking about resilience, particularly um, looking at sort of whether where it's appropriate to have enhanced protections for consumers who may be vulnerable, for example, or designing products that have customers in mind and, and flexible arrangements to support consumers in financial hardship, um, particularly, or I guess where we see this particularly is in relation to credit and debt arrangements, or for example, insurance arrangements where you know, consumers are experiencing hardship, they may need some temporary variations in contracts to help them, particularly where that hardship 
is associated with a with a temporary situation such as you know a loss of a loss of um, employment or, or something like that um so yeah i think um the financial consumer protection uh piece is is very very important to supporting financial resilience and working alongside these other interventions where perhaps individuals have got more you know autonomy or control um to uh to support overall financial resilience and ultimately financial well-being thanks Vesco. uh thank you i'll try to have one more question i know uh, mary is quite concise could you say a few words about priorities of ussec uh, for investor education mary yes thank you vasco uh, i would say that in terms of our uh, investor protection priorities uh, keeping in mind that we are a disclosure-based uh, regulatory scheme, we the Commission is looking at emerging asset classes, uh, crypto, of course, and complex products, uh, the digital engagement practices that are aimed at retail investors, and some private fund regulation. Now, in terms of investor education, we are dealing with the effects of the increase in retail trading. And there are positives about this, of course, um, in terms of more participation in the markets, um, but it also creates challenges in education. The lack of long-term planning, uh, the effects of gamification, uh, where over-trading is typically unsuccessful, and the meme stock phenomenon, um, which is not likely to re uh, lead to positive results over time. Uh, crypto as the regulatory and disclosure uh, space uh, becomes more defined. Uh, there will be a need for a lot of investor education um, about that and fraud will uh, always be uh, continue to be an, an issue. Uh, in terms of uh, the only other thing the ESG uh, interest in ESG in the US is increasing, but it is a complex space. Um, and really that will be one of the focuses uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I I think now it's uh, we, we need to close the webinar, but I'd like to thank you for your input. I really like your presentations that collectively uh, form a dense layer of information with many thoughtful insights. I think there's a lot of work ahead, and it's particularly uh, for cooperation, in my view, between IOSCO, C8, and uh, OECD on investor resilience and financial resilience, the connection between the concepts. And I think this webinar provides us with a lot of insights to think and plan for the challenges that we, we have to deal with in the years ahead. Thank you so much. And for the audience, this webinar, the video recording will be available on the web page of World Investor Week. Thank you so much and have a good day or good night wherever you are in the world now. Thank you.